All right, so if you have your notes from last time, the 10.1, have those out next to you as we do 10.2. Okay, so just, if you don't, it's okay, it's not a big deal, but I wanna reference back to some of the things we did in 10.1. Because 10.2, what we're gonna do is we're going to find the number of ways certain things can happen, but we're not going to do it by making lists. And that's what we did in section one, right? We wrote out all these lists. Even when we didn't have a list, we had a table that we used to create a list, sort of, right? When we did like the charts with the summations of the dice and things like that. Um, all right, so today, the first thing I want to talk about is um, factorials. So if you have seen this exclamation mark before used in mathematics, it's called a factorial. So when you have a factorial, it looks like this. In factorial means you take that number times one number less, and one number less than that, all the way down until you get to the number one. And we'll do an example of that, and that works for all counting numbers in. So n is 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're not talking about fractions or decimals or negatives or, or anything like that. Just the counting numbers. And by definition, 0 factorial is the number 1. And we need that definition with some of the formulas that come about. Um, and that, that's why we're sort of mentioning it here. All right, so we're going to do a couple of examples. Um, the first one is a direct application of uh, this formula. So we're going to take 5 factorial. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write out what in the world that means with that formula. So what does it mean to say 5 with this exclamation point? Five times six times six times Close, but you went up. You said 7 and 6. We want to go oh, down okay. from there. So five, four, there you go. So 5 times 4 times... 3 times 2 times 1. And you can, this is why you're going to want your calculator, because eventually you're going to have enough multiplication here. You're not going to want to do this either in your head or by paper, right? So if you multiply 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, what do you get? 120. Okay, everybody good with that? All right, so the next one I'm drawn, that I'm using is for the purpose of you understanding what you can and can't do in terms of canceling things. All right, so if you've got factorials here, you can't cancel the 8 and the 4 and reduce them like that, okay? But there is some cancellation that is appropriate, and that's what I want to show you next, okay? So, again, one thing you could do is you could multiply the entire thing on top out, 8 down to 1, multiply the bottom, 4 down to 1, and then you could divide the 2. You, you could do that. But at some point, we're going to get numbers that are large enough that this is not going to be a very productive use of our time. Okay, even with a calculator, at some point we're going to use some values that the calculator is going to be too large for the calculator to handle. So there's this idea of canceling that is helpful in that situation, so I'm going to show you that in this situation. I'm actually going to write down that I've got 8 times 5, 5, sorry, 7, times 6, times 5, times, and I'm going to stop at 4 factorial, and I'm going to stop with the 4 factorial on bottom. Because 4 factorial on top and 4 factorial on bottom, those are exactly the same value, aren't they? I mean, I don't care what they multiply out to, they're going to be exactly the same. And when you have a fraction and you have a value on top and a value on bottom that are multiplied, we can reduce those. Do you remember that fact about fractions? So we can reduce with factorials as well, but only when they exactly match. Okay, so the 8 and the 4, we can't reduce those, but 4 factorial and 4 factorial, those will reduce. Okay? Sound good? And then all I have to do for multiplication is the 8, 7, 6, and 5. So I don't have near as much to multiply if I do the reducing first. What value do you get? 1680 is correct. Okay, so is everybody good so far? Why did you multiply all the way down to 1? You could have, but what I want to notice here, Colt, is that if I do this, one, 4, 3, 2, and 1 here, yeah, they, they all cancel out because they're going to match. So at some point, if I can get an exact match in the numerator and in the denominator of a factorial, I don't have to write them out, which is nice. Okay. 
Now, this one has sort of the same idea as the last one, except you see two factorials in the denominator, right? I have a 10 factorial there twice. So on this one, I am going to write the 20 out until I get down to 10 factorial, and I'm going to stop just like before. So 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14. I'm out of space. Let me move my guys down. Thirteen, twelve, eleven, and I'm going to stop with the 10 factorial because just like on the last one, I have a 10 factorial in the denominator to match. Uh oh, there are two 10 factorials. That's exactly right, but I have two 10 factorials in the denominator. So one of them I don't need to write out because it's going to match and it's going to reduce, but the other one I do need to write out because I'm going to have to actually work with that one to get it to reduce. So the other one I'm going to write 10, 9, 8. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. So these 10 factorials on the end, that's where I put them, uh, those are going to match, and I can reduce those. Everything else, I need to reduce it. And again, you have choice. If you want to multiply everything on the top together, multiply everything on the top bottom, and then do the division, you can do that. But all the factorials we're going to be working with, and you're about to see why as we move further into this chapter, are actually going to reduce. Everything in the denominator will reduce with something in the numerator. Everything will. So if I want to do a little bit reducing, then that's going to make it easier on the calculator, again, if I had really large values especially, and it's going to make things cleaner on, on everything else too. So some of these you can actually pair up and they reduce wonderfully. So can you find me two numbers in the, num in the denominator that match something in the numerator? No match. Oh, 20 no, 10. 20 and 10, or so 20 and... 10 and 2, right? 10 times 2 in the denominator is 20. And so that reduced with a 20 in the numerator. So that worked. Is there any others you see that would match like that? 3. All right, so the 5 times 3 is 15, so I can reduce that with a 15 on top. I think that may be it on pairs. So now we're just going to go one at a time. How about let's start with the denominator's 9. What will that 9 reduce with? 18. So if I reduce this 9 and this 18, what does the 18 become? 2. two. How about my 8? Eight? 8 can reduce with 16, and the 16 becomes a 2. Another 2. Yep. How about the 7? Seven? 7 and 14, and the 14 becomes a 2. 6 and 12, and the 12 becomes a Two. That, that this doesn't always happen, but we're getting a lot of twos here. That's kind of fun. Um, and then the four. That's, that's about it. Slow down. You know, with this is two. Two times two is four. There you go. I've got two two. I've got lots of twos, but I specifically have two twos in the numerator. We'll take these two. Can those two twos in the numerator reduce with the four in the denominator? Well, sure, right? I mean, just like when I was looking for two numbers in the denominator to reduce with something in the numerator. So these two twos and this four can all go away at the same time. Oh. Now, your reducing and my reducing are probably not going to look the same in general, and that's okay, because when you multiply the numerator out, no matter how you've reduced, as long as you've reduced properly, uh, you're going to the same answer. So there's nothing unique about how I'm reducing this. There's nothing specific that has to match. So if we grab a calculator, the one thing you do want to be careful of is that you make sure when you're grabbing your calculator that you find all the ones that are still left. So I'm going to write them out to remind us what we've got left. I've got a 19. What else do I have next? How about I do the 2 first? Right, this 2? Yeah, so that 2. And then 17. And then what? Another 2. Another 2. And then what? 13, and then 11. And 11. So for some of you, this is going to be easier than others, and the kicker is going to be whether or not you can read your own handwriting. Because if you're really sloppy, it's going to be really easy to lose something. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, you really needed me to tell you that. But, but do be real careful because it's really easy to lose one of these guys because you're canceling a lot of things. And if you're a little sloppy with how you're canceling, it's going to look like something's canceled that's not or whatever. So this is what we have. You can grab your calculator. And you're going to multiply these out. Did somebody get one? We reduced the 20 originally with the 10 and the 2. Okay. 
That was our. That was the first cancellation I did anyway. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna have a calculator. What do you get when you multiply 19 times 2 times 17 times 2 times 13 times 11? 184,756. Whoa! Oops. Yep, pretty large number. All right, so a couple of hey, things. I can't see the solution. Okay, just say it. It's all right. I'll move. <laughs> um, a couple of things about this you may be thinking, and some of you aren't afraid to ask, but you guys seem to be quiet today. I'm not sure why. Um, you might be thinking, how much work do I need to show you? Which is a fair question, right? Um, you have to show me this first step written out. All right? You have to show me the 20 down to the, the 11, and then the 10 factorial, and the 10 down to the 1, and then the 10 factorial. You have to show that written out. And then you have to show that you're reducing pieces, okay? That you've started canceling pieces. I don't care which canceling pieces happen to work for you or you happen to see. That's fine. And then you, this step right here, this would be my optional step, okay? Do it or don't do it, I don't care. Um, but this first step is necessary, and then, of course, the solution at the end is necessary. And I would be remiss if I didn't say it, that some of your calculators have buttons that with, with the factorials, and I, and I know that, okay? Um, so that's fine, and if you use your calculators to verify your solutions, that's fine, but you still have to show me these pieces along the way. Um, and the issue is that eventually, if you do a large enough factorial, your calculator is not going to help you anyway because it's going to have a memory overflow. Um, even the Yikes. fancy ones, like the one that Austin has up here. Hold your calculator up, Austin. Even these, this is the one that I have too, I have, or a similar one. Um, I, I can show you where it is as you guys are doing group work. But in a way, ends up as error. Yes, it will give you an error. It will say overflow. So I want to show you how to do it so that that overflow issue isn't what keeps you from being able to do the problem. Does that make sense? Because if your numbers do get too large, your calculator won't help. All right, let's take a look at number four. Number four looks different because I've got letters in it. But it, I really don't, right? Because I've got this sort of funny-looking formula. I mean, that's what it looks like. It looks like a formula. But I'm told what the letters all are, aren't I? I'm told that N is 28 and R is 15. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to write them down. I'm going to say N is... Sorry, it came out again. Let's try again. Um, so I'm going to put the 28 factorial on top, and then R is 15, so this is 15 factorial on bottom, and then I have 28 minus 15 for the N minus R with a factorial on bottom. That, that would equate to 15 factorial? Um, for the second one, you mean? Yep. Yeah, so this would actually be the same as writing out 28 factorial over 15 factorial, 13 factorial. And then I know the numbers on bottom don't match, but it looks a lot like the last problem now, right? Okay, so I'm going to write... It's the number where we're stopping. You get to pick. Okay, so in the denominator, where would you prefer to stop? Would you prefer to stop at a value that's larger or smaller? I prefer the smaller number. So you can pick and choose however you want to do that. So we're going to start with the 28 on the top, and we're going to write them out just like on the last one. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Again. No, it's it's not. It's this cord. It's, I know it's not quite a long enough cord. You need a longer one for sure. Yeah. One that's a little bit less finicky. All right, we've got 28, 27, 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, and yes, you have to show all of the steps. No, you were thinking it, weren't you? Really? Yes. 20, 19, 18, I'm out of space, 17, <laughs> 16, and apparently I'm going to stop at 15 factorial because I'm out of space, but 15 is where I would have stopped anyway. Yes, Colt. Why do you have 13? Why is it 13 and not 15? Because 28 minus 15 is 13. Yeah. So they don't always match, though, right? But I will tell you this. This actually is a formula. There's a reason for me using this example. We're going to see this come, come across in just a little bit later I anyway. I thought you had worked out the 28 or something. No, not yet. 
<laughs> not yet. So we're going to down here, I just have a 28 minus the 15. All right, and then in the denominator, I've got a 15 factorial, which is good because I had a 15 factorial to cancel with the one on top. And I'm going to write down 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I'm going to cancel my 15s, 15 factorials. All right, so I'm going to take suggestions. Who wants to cancel what? Sounds good. 13 times 2 is what, Katrina? 26. Okay, what's next? 7 and 4. 7 times 4 is 28. Looks good. Now what? 12 times 2 is, oh, I already, can't, I, I already canceled my 12, or my 2. But I can cancel the 12 and the 24 if you want. I can reduce them. Okay, so I'll reduce the 12 and the 24, and what will the 24 become? A 2. That'll work. All right, now what? You can cancel the 11 and the 22. Sounds good. Two. It would. 11 and 22, and the 22 becomes a 2. Then 10 and 20. Okay, let me do, I heard both of them, so let me do 10 and 20, 20 becomes a 2, and then 9 and 27, and the 27 becomes a 3, and I actually have a 3 in the denominator too, don't I? So this 3 over here and this 3 could reduce. Okay, now what? 8 and 16, and the 16 will become a 2, looks good. Six and eighteen. Six and eighteen, and the eighteen will become a three. three. Now it's five and twenty-five. Five and twenty-five, and twenty-five becomes a five. All right, so this is what you would have to show, okay, some variation of this with your cancellation markings. I'm going to write down so I can collect my terms of what's left. I have a five, two, twenty-three. 2, 21, 2, 14, no, I'm sorry, 19, 3, 17, and 2. This is the longest one we've had of leftovers at this point. So someone with a calculator is going to tell me the long value this becomes. And the magic number is, drum roll please. Do you have a cold? Yeah, I'm not going to change. Okay. You canceled the 20s. You yeah. used 2 and 10, so why is it 2 above the 20? I didn't use 2 and 10. Uh, I canceled this 10. I already canceled the 2 out when I did 2 and uh, 13 for 26. But you could have. I mean, it would have been fine. You just would have a 2 in a different spot left over. So that's why I say there's really not a unique way or a one specific way to do this. Did we get a value? Did you get one? I have a bigger number than that, but I could have it wrong. 48. Mine's bigger than that, too. What it, but I might just have it written down wrong. Nobody has a... Conf we got two different answers. I got a 32 million and a 48 million. Now, wait. Can somebody double check? Are you getting one for us? Did you get it in there right? I have 37. You have 37 million. Do you have 37 million as well? Yeah. Okay, I misheard. All right, so 37 million. What's next? 442,160. 160. All right, there we go. Whoa! Large number, right? And I'm on the very bottom of the screen. Sorry about that. That is the largest number yet. That is the largest number yet kind of thinking maybe that the Apple TV with the smaller screen might be a little bit more helpful at this point. Okay, you guys ready for the next slide? All right. Fundamental principle of counting says the following. If we have a task that can be separated into different parts, um, then the number of ways to do the entire task is made up of the product of the number of ways to do the different parts.
Now, whether you realize it or not, you guys have actually encountered situations that have used this and or could have used this um, probably in the last couple of days. So quick show of hands, whoever has stood, stood in line and ordered the sandwiches at the ARA. Has anybody ever gotten in the sandwich line at the ARA? Okay, we've got some yeses, got some nods, got some hands, good. So the first thing you have to do is you have to get up there and you have to choose what? You have to choose your bread, right? So making your sandwich, and first of all, is making one step of choosing your bread. And after you choose your bread, you have to choose your meat. And then you have to choose your cheese. If you, I mean, and then we go to vegetables, and we've got condiments and so forth. That's an example of how many. And so if we wanted to actually figure out how many different sandwiches we could make, we could do that with the fundamental principle of counting, Okay. And all you have to do is you have to count up each of the individual different things you're making the choice of. How many different choices do I have for bread? How many different choices do I have for meat? How many different choices for cheese and so forth? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any questions on the idea behind this? I know the notation looks funny, but this is the way it's properly written because we don't know how many different things we're choosing from. That's why you've got these funny subscripts is because I can't just say it's A times B times C because you may be making more than three choices. Okay, but you will notice that this problem starts to look like what we saw last time. Do you remember Nate and Abigail and Bailey, Macy and Elias from 10.1? Oh, yeah. All right. Baby, Nate, David, Elias, and Macy. All right. Thank you, Leah. So when we're taking a look at that in the last section, what we did is we actually created those lists. And then at the end, I told you it doesn't really ask me to write down how many but I want to show you that we could write down how many when we counted them up. And I said, we'll come back to this later. Do you guys remember me saying that? We talked about the fact that we'll, we'll come back to this later. Well, now's later. Okay, so we're going to have the same three questions that we had from 10.1. So if you've got your 10.1, this is where I want you to compare when we're doing this. All right, so the first question was, we want a president and a treasurer if they are not of the same sex. So the way that I deal with fundamental principle of counting, and there's probably other ways of sort of thinking about it, but I actually draw lines for how many choices I'm making. So I have two choices because I've got two different people I'm picking. I'm picking a president and I'm picking a treasurer. All right, so when I pick my president, how many different choices do I have of persons who could be president? Well, there were six because there were six different people listed, right? And it doesn't say that I have to have any one of those specific six, so any of the six could work. But I do have a condition that I haven't mentioned yet as I'm working with the numbers. The condition's what? Not of the same sex. So after I pick the first person, how many choices do I have left for my treasurer? Three. So let's talk about why that three is. Once I pick my president, I've either picked a boy or a girl. I don't know which one, but let's just say right now for the sake of argument that it's a boy. Once I've picked my boy for president, I have to then pick a girl for treasurer, don't I? And there are only three girls left, three girls period to pick from. And then what I do according to the fundamental principle of counting on the previous page is that I multiply these numbers together. And six times three then is 18. So there are 18 ways that this could happen. Okay, so let's compare contrast for a moment. This is a different question than in 10.1, isn't it? Somebody read me what 10.1's actual question on that first example said. But what did the question ask about? To list the different ways. There you go. The question said list the different ways. And this question just says find the number of ways. Okay? So you're going to have to be aware of what your question asks you, especially when you get to the test. Because I'm going to ask you some of both. I'm going to ask you for some ones that say list, and if you give me just this number 18, you didn't do what I asked. And if I ask you to find the number of ways and you did the list, then it's going to take you a lot longer than I intended and eat up some of your time. Make sense? So be aware, underline, highlight, whatever you need to do as you're reading carefully what the question's really asking. 
At this section, we're just asking to find the number of ways. All right, let's take a look at the second one. Again, the same as second one that you had before. We've got a president, a secretary, and a treasurer, and the president and the treasurer are women. All right, so we have three things we're picking from, correct? And I'm listing my president first, my secretary in the middle, and my treasurer last, just the order that they're written in so that we can keep that straight, okay? All right, so how many choices do I have for president? Three girls. I have three different girls. Now I'm going to jump to the treasurer. How many choices do I have for treasurer? Two. Two, because I can't have the same person be president and treasurer. Make sense? So I'm down to two girls. Who can be in the middle? Who can be the secretary? Anybody. Anybody. But those two people I already picked, right? Whoever I put in president role and treasurer role, they're done. I can't pick them again. So how many choices do I have left in the middle? Five. Four. I have four. So then we're going to multiply. Again, fundamental principle of counting says I multiply the number of ways of making these choices. What is three times four times two? 24, and did we get 24 last time? We did. So there are 24 ways of forming this. Now 17 has a little caveat, a little difference in what's going on, and the difference relates to the word that we noticed last time, and that word was committee. And the issue is that when you do a committee that I can't switch the order, right? Because it just is the same group of people. Right? I mean, if I choose Bailey and Abby, it's the same as choosing Abby and Bailey if there's no discrete type, like descriptive titles for the positions they were chosen for. It's so, that trial time. Nope, not yet. <laughs> Slow down on that. All right, so we're going to take a look at two people still. So we've got two choices, two blanks. How many people can be in position number one? Six. I have six people to choose from. Well, yes, only one can be there, that's true. But I have six to choose from in that spot. How many people could be, how many choices do I have for position number two? I have five. Now, the problem is that if I just multiply six times five, it's going to include all those double counts, all those switches. It's going to include the AN and the NA as two separate entries, which means it's going to have exactly how many too many? Half. I mean, it's going to have twice as many as I really need, right? Because it's going to include doubles. So every person's group is going to be listed twice. It's going to be listed as AB and as BA. Is everybody following with me? So this is going to actually give me two t uh, twice as many as I need. Because it's going to double count things. So if it's committee, you just multiply it out and then divide it by two? Exactly. That's right. So I've got six times five and then divide by two, which is going to give me what? 15, and did we get 15 last time? Did we? Does anybody have theirs with them? We did? Yeah, Laramie says we did. Okay, good. Yeah, we got 15. So we divided by 2 to remove the double counts. Any questions on that one? All right. Question number 8. So we're going to take a look at some different kinds of testing situations next. All right, so we're taking a look at a, a certain number of question tests. The first one is a true-false test, and there are six questions. So we're going to start out just like I did on the last problems with the committees and the president, secretaries, whatever, is I'm going to write down blank spots for how many questions I have, okay? So I've got six questions, which means I have six choices to make an answer on. Six question test. It's a true-false test, which means how many different answer choices do I have? Two in every single blank, right? Because my answer on problem or question one, at least in theory, being true or false, would not directly affect whether or not my answer on question two is true or false. Make sense? So I have two possibilities in each one of these spots. And then I would multiply. Hey, it's like two to the sixth power. It is two to the sixth power, which is 64. So there are 64 ways that I could do this. So the idea is that I could actually have, if I were a teacher teaching a class with a six question true false quiz, because that's awfully short, it's gotta be a quiz, can't be a test. All right, so if I had 64 people in my classroom, 
I could have every single person turn me in a test that looks different. That's kind of crazy, right? If we were all randomly guessing and things like that and we didn't have any prior knowledge, so we're not as likely to get things right or wrong. or whatever. We could have 64 legitimately different tests where at least one thing was different on every person's test. Okay, 64 different tests. Now, let's change this. Same six questions, so same six blanks. But what changed? Five types of choices on each question. It's a multiple choice test. It's a multiple choice test, which means you have more than two choices each time to make, for, make a decision from, right? You have five. five. So each one of these blanks is going to be a five now. Yes, it does. What's 5 to the 6, or if you multiply it 5? All right, so picture again. Like the last test, I can have 64 people in my classroom. They all turn in uniquely different tests. Now I can have 15,000 in a classroom. And I only got a six-question test here. That's kind of crazy, right? It doesn't feel like it should be that big, but once we change those answer choices to have more answer choices, it's exponentially larger than it was before. All right, let's do another one. We've got a matching test now. Now, this is a little different, and it's only five questions because um, the problem has the five here instead of the six, but I have a five-question test, and it's matching, okay? So, you guys remember how this kind of works. You've got usually a, like a, a test, you know, a bank of answers. You've got five answers over here. You've got five fill in the blanks or whatever that you're trying to match things to the descriptions or whatever. So, the first question that you come to, how many choices do you have? Five. But the answer is used exactly once. Exactly. And that, that's not always the case for this kind of a test, but the description here says each answer is used once. So after I answer question number one, how many choices do I have for question number two? That's four. Then three. Then three. Then, two. then, mm -hmm. then one. Exactly. So and I'm narrowing it down. You guys like these kind of tests in some sense, right? I don't know. I did too because you can mark course. them out and pick something else. Process of elimination. All right. So we've got five times four times three times two times one, which looks an awful lot like what? Five factorial. It is. That one's five factorial. We've actually done that already today. What was 5 factorial? 120. So there are 120 ways that you could do this five question multiple choice test. Wow, that made it a whole lot easier. It's definitely easier than the multiple choice, right? Much fewer options. I mean, I know I've got five questions instead of six, but it, if you multiply this number by six, it's still not going to be anywhere near 15,000. All right, now, I don't know if you've ever had one of these tests. You probably have, number 11. Five-question matching test, but there are 10 answer choices. They're still used exactly once, but you've got 10 things to pick from. Have you done tests like these before, too? You've got distract your answers in there. I yeah. think this is 10 factorial over 5 factorial. Well, we'll get there in a second. Let's just write down our answer choices. So question number one, how many choices do I have? I have to 10. Question number two, nine, eight, seven, and six, right? All right, so these are going to be multiplied. And what do you get when you multiply these out? 30, so there are 30,240 ways to take this test. So as an instructor, making it more difficult, did you make it more difficult by adding five distractor answers to just randomly guessing? A lot more difficult, right? You created 30,000 different ways that people could have answered this instead of 120, simply by having five legitimate five distracting answer choices within that answer bank. And Leah mentioned, and she is exactly right, this actually is 10 factorial over five factorial. Because what you notice is missing from this factorial, if I were to write 10 all the way down, is you're missing the 5 down, right? You're missing the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So if I put that 5 factorial on the bottom, that would have removed that piece. You guys don't have to recognize that here, but it is, it, that is a correct statement. Yes, Brittany? Would this be how they calculate how many different drink combinations you get assigned? 
is exactly how they calculate. We're not quite there because the thing that we didn't discuss when we discussed my sandwich example is that what if you choose two different kinds of meat or three different kinds of meat on that sandwich? Or what if you go to Sonic and you like to add strawberry and vanilla into your drink? I mean, you know, if money's no option and you want to add four flavors, yeah, so, yeah, but you, we're going to get to that a little bit more later um, on what happens when we increase the number of different options we're choosing. But, yes, that is how we calculate that. What number is it? It's like three million something, isn't it? Drink combinations? It's a lot. Yeah. Yes, that is how they calculate that.